Good evening. Welcome back to the Slingerland Structured Literacy three-part webinar. This evening, we're presenting part two entitled Structured Literacy, Deep Dive into the Content of Instruction, What is Taught? Before introducing our presenter, I just wanna walk through a couple of reminders. Uh, this is a 90 minute presentation and it's also broadcasting on YouTube. Only the presenter will show because hopefully, well, it looks like a few of you may, I'm wanting everyone to be muted and to also turn off your video if possible. Uh, this way you can take a break, you can stretch, move around without interrupting the presentation. We do hope to have time for questions and answers at the end of the session. So please post your questions in the chat box as a chat to all, and I will be collecting them during the session. Dr. White will review any leftover questions and provide feedback as appropriate. Now to introduce our presenter, Dr. Nancy Cushion White. Dr. White has a private practice in assessment and remediation of language-based learning problems. She is also a consultant with both public and independent schools. Dr. White serves on the board of the Slingerland Institute and is a former member of the board of directors of the International Dyslexia Association. Additionally, Dr. White has more than 40 years experience in public schools as a classroom teacher and program consultant in special education curriculum with San Francisco Unified School District. She has served on advisory and content review panels for California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, Curriculum Commission, and the California Department of, Department of Education. Most recently, the AB 1369 Dyslexia Guidelines Writing Work Group. Dr. White, welcome, and it's all yours. Thank you very much. Welcome to part two of our Structured Literacy Webinars. Oops. I wanna, before I start, I just wanna take a second to remember our friend and colleague, Allison Seidel, some of you knew Allison very well. In your handout, I included her uh, perfect in every way Seidel bell curve, not because that's part of the presentation tonight, but because that was one of her contributions that she really enjoyed creating for us. I also wanna tell you that everything I know about PowerPoint, I learned from Allison, which she forced me to learn in the beginning. I went kicking and screaming all the way, but thank you because I wouldn't be able to have put this presentation together without her. Well, unfortunately, we lost her exactly 10 years ago this evening. And I just wanted us to think of her as we go through this presentation. So keeping things current, homeschooling at Stowe Lake and Golden Gate Park. And I was referring to them as ducks. I was informed by one of my East Coast colleagues that they're Canadian geese, which of course they are. So, but homeschooling is occurring everywhere. Students who are struggling with learning to read are in almost every classroom, but instruction effective for teaching them often is not. You have also in your handout, an infographic that was created by Carolyn Cowan. And um, I want, I added something after you received your handout which is this slide because the, I had quite a few questions asking about structured literacy and there's some confusions out there about what it means. And so I wanna point out, first of all, the term, it's an umbrella term. It's not referring to any particular approach or program. It's an umbrella term used for teaching approaches and, and programs that include features of core content and principles of effective instruction that are outlined in the infographic, in Carolyn's infographic that you have in your handout. They differ in, well, synonyms for structured literacy would be multi-sensory or multimodal structured language education, another synonym structured language and literacy. And the programs and approaches differ in many different ways. They, some are approaches, some are programs. Programs are published, they're pretty much set but there are a huge variety of programs in every one of the ways that are listed that I'm gonna list. 
Same thing for approaches. Approaches can be more um, designed more specifically for a particular group or a particular individual student. There's somewhat, there's more flexibility, but again, approaches also vary. They vary in depth and breadth of information and how it's presented, the degree of teaching to the intellect versus rote memorization, requirements for the training of teachers, intensity and duration. So basically what I'm saying is this umbrella term includes certain content and principles, but you still have to do your homework. And if you're considering any particular structured literacy approach, you need to really find out if it's the one that's best suited for your student uh, or students and um, inquire according to those other aspects. So the Slingerland approach is one structured literacy approach. And this is an, an exemplar lesson plan. It includes quite an emphasis on um, letter formation and learning to write, which some of the other structured literacy approaches may do uh, less of. And of course, the auditory leading to, with the goal of independent writing and the visual approach, which is ultimately for the goal of independent reading. And I'm gonna refer back to this lesson plan. Again, this is one structured literacy approach, but the work samples that I'm gonna be showing you are Pro, our Slingerland lessons. And so I'll show you where that fits into this particular format. Every classroom includes students with dyslexia. Most students with dyslexia have their core weakness in phonological processing, which we discussed in part one. And phonological processing is gonna affect decoding and spelling, which are foundational skills for higher level reading and written expression. Too many classrooms lack effective instruction for teaching these students. Structured literacy explicitly teaches systematic word identification, decoding, and spelling strategies, but it does it within the context of teaching how the language works. Reading scientists estimate that 95% of all children can be taught to read at a level constrained only by their reasoning and listening comprehension abilities. Kids with dyslexia are the canaries in the coal mine of our nation's reading instruction even if some people want to believe they don't exist. If you're not familiar with IDA's knowledge and practice standards, please uh, check them out and become familiar with them because they will say a, a lot more than I'm able to say tonight in our 90 minute session. Um, although dyslexia and related reading and language problems may originate with neurobiological differences, they're most effectively treated with skilled teaching. Informed and effective classroom instruction, especially in the early grades, a tier one instruction, can prevent or at least effectively address and limit the severity of reading and writing problems. Potential reading failure can be recognized as early as preschool and kindergarten or sooner. And that me recognized meaning finding those students who are at risk for having difficulty, not diagnosing, not formal diagnosis, not label with a specific term, but being recognized as kids who need help sooner rather than later. A large body of research evidence shows that with appropriate intensive instruction, and I'll add delivered by trained teachers with fidelity, all but the most severe reading disabilities can be improved in the early grades within the general ed classroom and students can get on track toward academic success. It doesn't mean that some of those students may not need more help than they can get in the general ed classroom, but they can get help right at the beginning and not have to wait. And again, KPS is referring to the knowledge and practice standards. For those students with persistent dyslexia who need specialized instruction outside the regular class, competent intervention from a specialist can lessen the impact of the disorder and help the student overcome and manage regardless of the severity of the symptoms. But again, that specialist needs to be trained and needs to be using the approach that um, has been chosen with fidelity. Teacher knowledge and skills matter, but so do appropriate approaches to instruction and intervention. Approaches guided by scientific evidence. 
It's not the case, as is sometimes claimed, that a highly skilled, knowledgeable educator can teach reading effectively using literally any method. Even the most capable doctor on the planet is not going to cure anyone of cancer by using bloodletting and purging techniques or suggesting injection or ingestion of disinfectant to kill a virus. Likewise, even the most competent teacher cannot be successful in teaching reading, especially to those at risk or those struggling when using instruction that doesn't lend itself to effective teaching of important foundational and component literacy skills. It's not an either or proposition. Both capable teachers and research-based instructional approaches are necessary. Capable teachers and effective instructional approaches. I was uh, uh, applying for a job once at a, at a university and parts of a part of the application process was to teach a class to their credential students. And so I got to choose the topic and I thought decoding would be an appropriate topic since I love decoding and I, and I really believe it's uh, one of those things that every teacher could benefit from understanding how to teach. So I made my presentation and at the end, one of the young men in the class raised his hand and he said, Dr. White, I just wanted to tell you that the reason that works for you is because you're so enthusiastic about it. And I said, well, I am enthusiastic about it, that's true. But the reason I'm enthusiastic about it is because it works. I had a lot of enthusiasm when I first began teaching and that enthusiasm only got me so far because I didn't really know how to teach the kids who most needed me. I could teach the kids who were gonna learn in spite of me, but I couldn't teach the ones who really needed me to do my job. So I agree that enthusiasm helps, but it's not enough. We went over this last week, but I just wanna uh, emphasize one more time, development and integration, phonological, orthographic, and semantic pathways. They're critical in reading acquisition for everyone, but they're impaired in most people with dyslexia, which is why we have to teach in a way that integrates those pathways for those people who aren't able to do it for themselves. Proficient word identification requires the formation of grapheme phoneme connections to bond the spelling, pronunciation, and meanings of specific words in memory. Stanislas Dehan, a French uh, researcher, says, it simply is not true that there are hundreds of ways to learn to read. When it comes to reading, we all have roughly the same brain that imposes the same constraints and the same learning sequence. He goes on to say, all children, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds, benefit from explicit and early teaching of correspondences between letters and speech sounds. Regardless of their background, children who do not learn letters and graphemes suffer from reading delays that are often far from negligible and may persist for many years. This is a well-established fact corroborated by a great many classroom experiments and coherent with their present understanding of how the reader's brain works. You have the outline of questions. I'm not gonna go through it. I'm gonna do my best to get all the way through. Um, I wanna uh, acknowledge in advance that some of you may be a little frustrated that I'm not able to spend more time on specific pieces of this, but in an hour and a half in order to get through all the parts, I can't. Certainly it would be possible after these three webinars are over, if you had interest in others that would go more in depth in some of these uh, content areas that talk to Elise, but just warning you ahead of time that I might not say as much as you want, or maybe I'll say more than you want. I hope not. So levels of language structure that would be covered in a structured literacy approach from below the word level to the text level. So what is taught? Phonology, phonics, including syllable instruction, morphology and etymology, syntax and grammar, vocabulary, semantics, text reading fluency, 
and purposeful integration of reading, spelling, written expression, and handwriting. And again, if depending upon the structured literacy approach that you're using or you're trained to use, there'll be perhaps more or less emphasis on some of these areas, but to be a bona fide structured literacy approach, these areas should be included. And this is just a little uh, teaser for next, for part three, which is how it's taught. I'm not gonna say anything else about it, but those are the things we'll be discussing in part three. So EME, is a base element and it means, it's Greek from the Greek layer, minimal distinctive unit of a linguistic concept. So we have a phoneme, a smallest unit of sound contrast that creates words with different meanings. In each of these pairs of words, only one phoneme is different, but the meanings of those words are very, very different. A grapheme, which is the letter or letters that spell a single phoneme, it could be one letter, two letters, three letters, and a morpheme, smallest unit of meaning. So in the word decision, we have D-E, prefix, C-I-S-E, base, I-O-N, suffix. In infinity, I-N, prefix, F-I-N-E, base, I-T-Y, suffix. And each of those is a meaningful unit. Then we have phonology study of speech sounds in one language. Every language has a phonology. There are some languages that have no written form, so there's no orthography, but every language has a phonology if it's spoken, and it's not a language if it's not spoken or was spoken at some point. And the phonology has to do with the units of speech or phonemes within a specific language that create meaning only when combined. And there are certain conventions and rules for how phonemes can be con, uh, combined within each individual language. More, sorry. Morphology is the sequence and structure of meaningful units. And etymology, interrelationships of words with their own origins and with other words that share that origin through history. So we have words that are related, may have the same root, but they may not be related um, they may not have the same, from the same base element, morph, so they're morphologically, they're etymologically related, but not morphologically, because they have different bases, but if you go back to the original root uh, through history, then you're going to find that relationship. Until you're willing to be confused about what you already know, what you know will never become wider, bigger, or deeper. So when you if we come to anything this evening that you're not as familiar with and you don't feel like enough time was spent on it so that you really, really get it the way you want to, just consider that there's more to learn about it, but try not to be frustrated. This was a response to that, uh, the, was the question of the day for one of my high school classes. And this is what he wrote. It means that if you don't try new things, you will not learn anything new. So we have to not be afraid to try new things. So try to keep that in mind tonight. So content, integration is the key. Integration of phonology, phonics, syllables, morphology, syntax, and semantics. And the plus sign means that it's phonics, not just letter sound, sound letter, but more than that, including syllables. And of course, the morphology goes hand in hand with etymology. Evidence-based key elements of structured literacy work together. Teaching them separately without integrating, without making students understand how they fit together, how one influences the other, is leaving out some very important pieces. So again, phonology, the speech sounds. Within phonology, the phoneme awareness skills of blending, segmenting, and manipulation of speech sounds within words or syllables are a bridge to phoneme grapheme and grapheme phoneme associations. So understanding that place value that students learn from blending, segmenting, and manipulation of speech sounds is necessary for phonics to make sense. While basic levels of phonemic awareness, blending, segmenting, and phoneme manipulation are sufficient for beginning phonics, 
highest level phony manipulation with automaticity is necessary for orthographic mapping. So phonemic proficiency is, would be that automaticity of manipulation at the highest levels, which is foundational for orthographic mapping. But for the very beginning stages, those other skills would be sufficient. And just to re you saw this before, and this has that hierarchy in included that you can refer back to if you need to. This we talked about in part one. So what is a phoneme? A single speech sound. It's a distinctive linguistic unit. It's spoken, and that's really important. It's not just something we hear. It's what we're speaking. If we didn't speak them, we wouldn't hear them. The smallest unit of sound contrast creating words with different meanings. So don't, don't I'm not gonna go any further. I'm gonna say three words and I want you to listen to, well, actually, I want you to repeat each one after I uh, say it. And then I want you to think about the three words and what's different. So house, please say it, house, mouse, louse. So what's, the di what's different? I wish I could hear you, but of course I can't. So I'm assuming that you're all saying that what's different is the, that initial consonant sound. And you can see it too in these words. So now listen to the next one, repeat. Street, straight, strut. What's different, what changed in those three words? The medial vowel sound. The fact, okay, next, sheaf. Oops, sorry, I wasn't supposed to do that yet. Sheaf. Beef, thief, what's different in these? It's the initial consonant sound again. The spelling of the vowel phonemes are different, but that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. We're talking about the speech sounds, the phonemes, and what changed phonemically is only the initial consonant sound. Let's do one more. Street, stream, streak. And of course, what's different in those three is the final consonant phoneme. What else is a phoneme? They're abstract, difficult to isolate or identify, partly because we learn to speak phonemes in words as soon as a baby is born, they're listening to words and, and uh, spoken by whoever is around them. And then when they do learn to speak, they learn words based upon meaning, not based upon what makes up, not the phonemes that make up each word. Phonemes can be altered by co-articulation, which simply means the sounds are phonemes that surround them or where they occur in a word. So say post and feel for the p phoneme. Say spark and also feel for the p. Oops. Stop. If you're not saying it, you're not going to be able to feel it. So please do say it. Lisp, sipped. Each one of those words has the phoneme p, but the way it feels is not exactly the same. It's still the phoneme p, and it's not any other phoneme, but it is affected by its uh, where it occurs in the word and phonemes that come before or after it. This is a journal entry of a student in one of my high school classes. It actually was the parent of one of the other students when we were doing a screening discussion about the possibility of her son attending summer school and she heard what we were gonna be doing. She asked if she could be a student in the class. And I told her it was fine with me, but she would have to get her son's permission. And he said it was fine. So she was in the class. She wrote this on the second day of a 19 day summer school. But I didn't, she didn't give it to me until summer school was over. So I didn't know what she was thinking, but this is what she wrote. And this is, I've written it exactly as, as she gave it to me. So if there's any, there are a couple of things that are uh, perhaps not as you would expect, but this is exactly the way she wrote it. Each day as I proceed on my path of learning how to learn, many emotions seem to block my path forward. I have an image come to mind. I'm in a large bird cage. In my youth, someone outside is calling to me, encouraging me and cursing me at the same time. There is the idea that I could, 
I should fly free if I would just come out of the cage. But I can't find my way out, so I'm cursed as stupid. Don't you know the difference between the B and the D, left and right? Can't you see the way out? I don't see. Eventually, the birdcage becomes real. No one expects me to find my way out of the cage. Instead, I sing wildly with my walls and play on the swing provided, eat a minimal diet of information, and suppress the almost now vague image of freedom. Many call me a creative bird, but I am not. That portion of creative thought which gets expressed in my simple songs is minuscule compared to what is unexpressed. One day I hear a voice from the outside. It says, here's a key that might unlock the door. It is the sound of the short vowels, ah, eh, i, ah, uh. There are five sounds. At first, I hear only one sound. Voices in my head are reminded of long ago. You're stupid, can't you spell? Don't you hear what I'm saying? The emotions are immense and jar the door shut. I cry softly. Imitating the person on the outside, I pull on my ear. Eh? Then, ah? Two sounds. An excited expectant hope starts to boil within. My point including this is that sometimes we assume that adults who are having struggles with reading and spelling don't have phonemic awareness issues. They do. We can't, we can't assume that they don't. We need to teach them. So Marilyn Adams in her uh, beginning to read Learning and Thinking About Print from 90, I think it was 91, it might have been 90, but I'm pretty sure it was 91. She defines phonemic awareness, not working knowledge, but conscious analytic knowledge, not just the ability to hear the difference between two phonemes that are spoken, not the ability to pronounce them. It, what is important is the awareness that they exist as abstract components and that they can be manipulated. And this awareness seems to depend upon the student's inclination or encouragement to lend conscious attention to the sounds as distinct from the meanings. Remember we talked about kid babies learn words by because of what they mean. They don't learn them as individual sounds. They're practicing the sounds from birth, but they're practicing the sounds because they are compelled to do so, but not necessarily do they recognize that they're parts of words. But what's important here is that inclination or encouragement. Some kids love wordplay. They love rhyme. They love to do things with sounds. And those kids are fun to play with in that way. But there are other kids who don't notice it. They're not inclined at all in that direction. They're the ones who need the practice the most and they don't get it because it isn't fun necessarily to do those things with them because they don't choose to. We have to incline them if they're not inclined. Phonemes are not sounds processed uniquely by the auditory system. Remember, it's not just hearing. It's speech sounds, the place and manner of articulation, what our mouths do in order to create or make a, a sound, speak. Phonemes are articulated sounds, speech sounds, the powerful motor system of speech, sequences and remembers phonemes. Letters or graphemes represent those articulated spoken sounds. The, this is, uh, yes, the leap to fluent, automatic, graceful recognition does require phonological awareness. But how does the skill of phonological awareness get developed in order for that to happen? This was an, uh, an email exchange that went back and forth for a while and Dr. Heron was responding. It has to involve learning how to segment words into their individual phonemes. Linking those sounds to letters, encoding. Most efficient way to develop that deep phonological experience by encoding. First, just CVC words, then regularly spelled words with blends with lots of dictation, no copying, in other words, Sound, uh, speech to print. So dictating a word and then having the student spell it by segmenting the individual phonemes. Encoding. This is a baby just a few weeks old and you can probably even tell which phonemes he's practicing. But he's practicing and he's obviously having a really good time. And this is a reminder that 
that's what comes first. This comes first, practicing those phonemes, the speech sounds, the auditory system is activated before anything that would even remotely have to do with reading or the symbols that represent those speech sounds. So phoning to graphing, speech to print, encoding before decoding. And many of you on this call are Slurner One teachers and you know that we always practice encoding so that that strategy is uh, learned and pretty automatic before we introduce the decoding strategy. So beware of putting the cart before the horse. The, those thousands of repeated connections between the centers of speech, comprehension, and word forms in the left hemisphere will form the neural foundation for what becomes the deep phonological experience. But that comes later. At the very beginning, encoding or spelling is less abstract than decoding because those sounds they've been practicing They've been pronouncing the words and we're simply making them aware, as Dr. Adams says, making, making them aware of the individual phonemes that make up those words. Phonological awareness is the open sesame linking sounds to letters and constructing words as the magic carpet. And with them, a child has the best chance of flying into reading and writing. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. The process of learning to read is, it, must be understood, or we must, as teachers, must understand it as a reorganization of oral speech. Everything that we do for teaching literacy is based on a foundation of oral language. It's transformation from an automatic process, what kids do, that phenomenal learning, very few need to be taught anything about that, dealing with whole words for speaking, oral communication, transformation from that automatic process to a voluntary consciously regulated process, segmenting words into their individual sounds and eventually doing that for reading, which then becomes automatic with practice. And this is not new guys, 1668. This emphasis on pronunciation and the oral motor function, 1668 is where this came, that picture came from. It's not a new idea. What would, it, this was, what would it take to make your mom perfect was the question. And this was the child's response. Diet. You know, her hair. I diet maybe blue. So word retrieval, but this is word retrieval based on some phonological confusion. So these were some mistakes that students made in their oral expression. And I have a wonderful story to go with everyone, but if I tell any one of those stories, I won't have time to get through. So I'm gonna really not tell you and it's really hard because I want to. So finges for hinges, stinks for sphinx, diaphragm for digraph. One of the best stories was that one. Chandelier for candelabra, camouflage for sabotage. And these were confusions. These were actually uh, word identification errors, but imagine what confusion that would cause in reading comprehension. So a student read hypochondriac for hypocrite, amnesia for insomnia. So phoneme awareness, remember, it's that conscious understanding that speech is composed of a sequence of sounds and that place value piece is important because if they understand that, then they know that those speech sounds can be taken apart and put together in different sequences, which create different words. It's the ability to identify and manipulate. It's not the same as phonics. There are 44 plus or minus phonemes of English, and you should try with a friend to list those 44. The reason it's not an exact number is because in certain parts of their of our country, they're gonna be different pronunciations. And so there might be one or more extra in some places, but definitely do it with somebody else. And you should probably do it with at least three because you wanna have enough uh, variation there that you can come to consensus. It makes it a little bit more interesting. But keep in mind, we're talking about 44 plus or minus phonemes. And those phonemes have more than 250 graphemes to spell them. All I'm asking for this exercise 
is for the phonies. Phonics requires mapping of those phonemes to their spellings, the letters, mapping of spellings to their pronunciations, decoding or reading again. And in the lesson plan, the encoding that we're talking about here, this is at the word level. And of course they would have already practiced the phoneme graphing and the graphing phoneme to get here, but encoding and decoding, that's where it would fit into the format. Phoneme awareness is a prerequisite for learning the alphabetic principle. Doesn't, phonics isn't gonna make sense if they don't have that place value. Phoneme graphing association, mapping of phonemes to their spellings and graphing phoneme association, which leads to decoding, mapping of spellings to their pronunciations. And again, we're assuming here that they've done practice with phoneme graphing practice, which prepares them to be able to do the encoding and graphing phoneme practice, which is a prerequisite for decoding. Priscilla Vale, one of her six, she had, every time she opened her mouth, she said something that I didn't ever wanna forget. But one of the things that she said that really made sense to me, words are tags that lead to concepts. So we might as well teach kids the words for what things really are rather than dumb it down and make it seem simpler. Because then if they hear the word that really is the um, vocabulary for a particular concept, they're not gonna recognize it if they haven't been using it. So terms and tools, the vocabulary of decoding. A vowel has a pattern or a grapheme, which is what we see in a word when we're trying to read the word. It has a sound or a, a speech sound or phoneme when we're trying to spell it or when we're speaking it. Consonants occur one at a time as part of a blend or cluster when each consonant is pronounced or in a digraph or trigraph when two or three letters would be used to spell one speech sound. Syllables can be closed or open and a syllable can be stressed or unstressed. Those are all parts of learning to both uh, read words and also to be able to take a word apart for spelling. There are two kinds of letters in English, consonants and vowels, and those letters have two different kinds of speech sounds, closed and open. My name was David, but that sounded old fashioned, so I shortened it to DVD. I'm not gonna have time to probably give this the time you would like. Most consonants are uh, spelled, most single consonants have only one um, phoneme association, but C can be C is in cat or C is in circus, G is in gas or gentle, S is in sit or raise, X is in six or exact. You can also have the C as in spacious or ocean, the S as in session or vision, and the X as in anxious. Consonants can occur in clusters or blends. There are some examples, digraphs or trigraphs. I could spend a lot more time on that, but I can't, but I don't, I, I shouldn't say I can, I cannot, okay. I promise I'll always be consonant. Zippy, Zippikins, we need to sit down and talk. Uh-oh, he says, how do you feel about renewing our vowels? Okay, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Will you love me forever, Zippy? I promise I'll always be consonant. Okay, there are six syllable types, but the syllable type is based upon the vowel graphing that occurs in the syllable. Some approaches and programs will give you seven, but that, I'll show you when we get to that one. So closed syllable is one type, vowel consonant silent E is another type, R controlled or a vowel followed by R. Open syllable, when the vowel, a single vowel is at the end, 
but they're too could be stressed or unstressed and the associated phoneme will depend upon whether it's stressed or unstressed. Val, val, val digraph, val team, those are three different names and there are lots of others when you've got two vowels. A letter combination, that's sometimes called something else, but what I'm talking about there, examples would be the um, uh, ang, ing, ang, ung, or ink, ank, ank. W-A-O-S-T-I-L-D. So there are combinations of letters that include vowels and consonants, but there's something in that combination that's pronounced in a way that's different from what we would usually expect. As I said, they have different names in different uh, programs, different approaches. And final stable syllable, which very frequently the programs will include consonant L-E, but less frequently they include some of the others, which um, are equally important, which you'll see in a minute. So modification of the vowel sound. When you see a vowel letter in a word, what is it that is going to tell you what the associated sound is going to be? Letters that follow the vowel or the vowel grapheme. That could be in vowel consonant for a closed syllable, or it could be vowel followed by another vowel and a vowel team. It could be vowel R. Position of the vowel grapheme in the syllable. If there's a single vowel at the end of a syllable, that's an open syllable. If you've got a vowel grapheme, vowel consonant silent E, that whole spelling has to be at the end of a, of a base word in order for that E to be silent. But the vowel phoneme itself is not at the end. It always has a consonant. Placement of the stress in the word and sometimes letters that precede the vowel grapheme. When you have W before A, it's, does, it isn't pronounced the way we would expect. It's water, not waiter, or um, wash, not wash. Is there any question in your mind that he's pronouncing ah? There's no other vowel sign he could be pronouncing with his mouth in that position. Syllables. Sorry, my computer's about ready to turn off. Okay, here we go. So a syllable's a linguistic entity. It's a unit of pronunciation. It has one vowel phoneme. It may or may not have surrounding consonant phonemes, but it has one vowel phoneme. But English is a morphophonemic language that is stress-based. So the pronunciation of polysyllabic words is primarily determined by the placement of stress. I'm gonna, I want you to repeat each of these words. I'm gonna tell you ahead of time, the base in every one of these words is exactly the same. So finite, say it, infinite, infinity, finish, define, definition, the base in every one of those words is F-I-N-E, but it's only pronounced fine in one of them, which is a reason not to teach a base element with its pronunciation, since its pronunciation will change depending upon where it lands in the word. The number of syllables and where the stress is placed will determine the pronunciation. The meaning, however, will be the same and the spelling will be the same. So remember, a syllable is a linguistic entity. It's, a, it's spoken, a syllable, it's a unit of pronunciation, one vowel phoneme, a vowel fo phoneme is open. Spoken language syllable divisions in English often do not coincide with the conventions for dividing written words into syllables. In my mind, that doesn't make the importance or the value uh, or the advantages of learning how to divide words into syllables any less useful, but it's important to keep in mind. So in the word little, and if I have slash marks, then I'm pronouncing it. If I have angle brackets, which you'll see in a second, then that's what I see. And so I'm going to name the letters that I see. In the word little, the spoken syllables are pronounced as little. That's how we say it. When we say 
he's a little boy. We don't say he's a little boy. Because the first syllable has one vowel letter spoken as a short vowel sound, it's a closed syllable. So the syllable must end with a consonant. Therefore, the written syllables in the word little are shown as L-I-T and T-L-E. In the word title, the spoken syllables are pronounced as title because the vowel graphing in the first syllable is one vowel letter at the end of the syllable, it's an open syllable. The vowel sound in this open syllable is long because the open syllable is stressed in that word. Therefore, the written syllables in the word title, excuse me, in the word T-I-T-L-E are also known as, shown as T-I, T-L-E. The result of the syllable combining process leaves a double T in L-I-T-T-L-E because it's a closed syllable that is not there in T-I-T-L-E or title, which is an open syllable. These spelling conventions were invented to help readers decide how to pronounce a word they didn't know. The conventions also help a student to know how to spell words, but knowledge of syllables alone is not sufficient for becoming a good speller. You need to know a lot more. The number of vowel graphemes in a word usually will indicate the number of spoken syllables. And that's one of the really important values of being able to a word in syllables and learning systematic strategies for doing so. Recognition, once you've divided the, you know how many syllables there are based upon the number of vowel graphemes, because each of those graphemes is going to spell an associated vowel phoneme. And once you've divided the word, then recognize, re recognition of the type of vowel grapheme and the vowel phoneme associated with that vowel grapheme helps accurate identification and correct pronunciation of longer unfamiliar words, especially critical content words in academic text. Now, yes, I would love to be able to spend a lot of time practicing all those different kinds of syllable division generalizations or conventions, but today we're just talking about content. So here's the lesson plan again, and you're, we're showing you that in coding, when you're segmenting and spelling those words, and decoding here when you're uh, blending those sounds together into words that you're reading. There's six basic syllable types, which you saw on an earlier slide, based on the vowel grapheme or the vowel spelling. A syllable type is only a type because of the vowel grapheme that's in it. And they were regularized by Noah Webster to justify dividing words into syllables in his 1806 dictionary. His goal was to make reading more accessible to people who were less educated. Sorry. So knowledge of syllable types allows students to apply strategies to systematically, not randomly, divide words into manageable chunks or syllables and that in turn allows them to accurately identify and pronounce longer unfamiliar words. They may be familiar once they know what they are in spoken uh, in language, but they are unfamiliar in print. They may be unfamiliar in both. Alphabetic writing involves phoneme-based characters. We write sequences of characters designed to represent sequences of phonemes. We do not remember words, whole words, via visual memory. And yes, you did see something similar to this last in part one. Orthographic memory versus visual memory. We do not remember words via visual memory. We remember words because of the orthographic patterns. I know that's fantastic, not because of what it looks like, but because it has a closed syllable fan, it has three closed syllables, fan, Fantastic. I recognize the letters. I know the associated phoneme represented by each of those letters, and I know how to divide the word into syllables. 
Same thing here. In this case, I might I need more than that because now I'm I might also include my knowledge of morphemes since I have um, a couple of suffixes and a prefix. But I know how to read the word because of the letters in the word, and some of those letters. Uh, are in graphemes that represent phonemes, others are in morphemes that represent meaning, and a combination of that allows me to read the word. But it's not because I've memorized what that word looks like, especially since it has different colors, different fonts, uppercase, lowercase, different size letters. So, just a quick recap. Value of phonemic awareness does not fade with time. Remember Lou's journal. She still needed to be able to segment those vowel sounds. Advanced tasks, measuring phoneme proficiency, not basic phonemic awareness tasks must be assessed for, must be used for assessment. In an alphabetic writing system, the need for phonological skills is unavoidable because the characters in English, the graphemes, represent speech sounds. They don't represent whole words. Back to Dahan again. Expert readers encode written words hierarchically and he starts at the top and goes so single letters and I have that grayed out because we don't use the term bigrams very often when we're talking about American English. Bigram could mean a consonant blend, it could mean a digraph, and since folks confuse blends, clusters, and digraphs anyway, I choose to underemphasize it. Graphemes, which represent, that could be one letter, more than one letter to represent phoneme syllables and morphemes. Another way of showing that, if we look at this word, in this case, each, each of the graphemes is designated or indicated. So the first graphing represents i, n, t, er, r, a, p, t, i, n. Now, if I were trying to, if I had no idea what that word was, suppose I was trying to decode a word in another less familiar language, I wouldn't even probably remember what all the sounds were by the time I got to the end. If I've divided the word into syllables, however, then I can blend those first two together. I, n, in, t, er, ter, in, ter, r, up, rup, in, ter, rup, t, i, n, ting. And yes, R, U, P is the syllable. The T, if you're dividing it into syllables, the T goes with the I, N, G. We'll get to the morphing in a second. So, in, ter, rup, ting. And then in interrupting, we have inter, the prefix, R-U-P-T, the base, and I-N-G, the suffix. So they're different. It's a hierarchical way, and, and it depends upon what the student knows. And understanding how to meld or integrate the use of phonology with morphology is extremely useful for both reading and for spelling. So memory for patterns, this is looking at it in a different way. So we're looking, we're talking, the patterns that the students are learning, that they're part of their orthographic memory are letters, graphemes, morphemes, syllables are linguistic or spoken units. We don't memorize syllables per se, although we do learn the final stable syllables. Spoken language syllable divisions, remember, do not always coincide with the way we speak them. So morphology is the study of meaningful elements within words. Prefixes, base elements, suffixes. There are two kinds of suffixes, inflectional and derivational. Inflectional suffixes, for the most part, do not change the part of speech. F-L-E-C-T is a base that means bend. So in, inflectional suffixes might change the tense, or it might change the number in nouns or the degree of an adjective, small, smaller, smallest. Derivational suffixes, the base element, and this is R-I-V-E, as in river, and that would mean what flows from one part of speech into another. So remember F-I-N-E, we had that base, uh, and there were lots of suffixes that were added to it. And so as the suffix changes, the part of speech changes, because that's what derivational suffixes 
generally do. Associated with improved, so the uh, morphological awareness or morpheme awareness is associated with improvement, word ID, vocabulary, spelling, and reading comprehension and written expression. Again, showing you where that would fit in. So we're now at the point where in spelling, the base elements plus affixes, we're dictating them in phrases, sentences, and paragraphs. And then if you're decoding, you're still dividing words into syllables for pronunciation, but you're also here, you're, that would be up here, but here you're teaching vocabulary and syntax and vocabulary and syntax are very much related to, uh, or vocab, voc can't talk, sorry. Vocabulary and morphology are very much, and grammar are very much uh, associated. So English is a morphophonemic language. This is speech and language pathologist. Note she's talking about kindergarten. She says, spelling is the engine that interconnects new word formation with vocabulary because English is morphophonemic. The teaching of spelling from a morphophonemic framework should begin in kindergarten. So this is just for fun. He's at his having a meeting with his psychiatrist. First, we'll analyze your inferiority complex through some word association. The first word, morphophonemics. Well, it wouldn't have anything to do with our inferiority complex because we know what it means. Okay, English orthography, not a failed phonetic trench transcription system invented out of madness or perversity. Instead, a more complex system that preserves bits of history, facilitates understanding, and also translates into sound. The ultimate test of the validity of a spelling principle, quote from David Crystal, we use it to predict the spelling of words as yet unborn. The underlying system is robust and regular, but struggles to be visible through the layers of orthographic practice introduced over the centuries by writers with different linguistic, cultural, and political backgrounds. The best way of defeating an enemy is to get to understand him. So the more we know about the spelling system, the better we'll be able to spell. Spelling is a linguistic problem that must be solved using linguistic tools. Most of you are familiar with Marcia Henry and her work in morphology. And I'm glossing over this very quickly, but we have the Anglo-Saxon layer or the Old English layer, Latin layer, Greek layer. It doesn't mean that we don't have words that come from other languages, but these are the, the three main ones. Morphophonemics, let's practice a bit. So in the word electric, if I wanna spell electrician, there, we know more than one way to spell shun. That's one of those final stable syllables, shun. And we could spell it T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N, C-I-A-N, or T-I-A-N. But I know if I'm spelling electrician, then it has to be a C because electric ends in that suffix I-C. I know that that has to be an A, because it's a person, electrician is a person. I-O-N is a suffix that makes a word into a noun that names an idea, A-N names a person. Inspire and inspiration. If I'm trying to spell inspiration, I hear that er, it could be spelled in, with any one of the five vowels. But if I take off a suffix and change the number of syllables, I have inspire, I can hear the I and then I know that that er is spelled with an I. Confide, if I'm trying to spell confident, what can, I can hear con pretty clearly. I, I know, oh, I know, I, okay. I can hear, so that's not a problem, but this is a, what I would call a schwi. It's an unstressed i in confident. But if I go back, if I take off the E and T and have confide, then I know that that's an I. In confidential, if I, if I, I still can hear the ah, uh, I still might have to go to confide to get the I, but knowing whether it's a, uh, how to spell the shul, which could be T-I-A-L or C-I-A-L, 
I know it's a T because confident ends in the T. So victory, we have another victorious. In this case, I don't know how to spell the uh, er in victory, but when I add, add a suffix and make more syllables, the stress shifts and the stress is on that second syllable, tor, and then I know that this is an OR. So that one worked in a little bit of a different direction. Define, definite, so you know define, you can hear the I for here. And if you don't know whether this is, because there's an A-T-E and an I-T-E suffix and they can sound exactly the same, but in definition, the stress is on the I, I at the end of, I at the end of a stress syllable before any of these final stable syllables that begin with sh is gonna be stressed and pronounced as a short I, it's always. I know that's not nearly enough to explain that if you wanna use it, but just so you know, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about, I can't talk about. So we've got image. Now that is a French um, word. And so it's got that French suffix, but I don't, if I don't know how to spell it, that's not gonna help me very much. But in imaginary, I can hear that ah. Okay. And then memory is another er, which becomes the or in memorial. So here's a couple of other examples. Sane is the base. It's a long A. Sanity is not spelled in an unpredictable way. It's very predictable because you're adding I-T-Y and you have to drop the E. But it's pronounced in a way that we wouldn't expect because there's only one consonant there. And here we have a uh, studious. We have a long U, U which changes to a short U. The base is S-T-U-D-E. And in abbreviate, we have the base is B-R-E-V-E and the E is pronounced as, with its long sound in abbreviate and with its short sound in brevity. And the reasons for all of those things, and I'm sorry that I can't discuss them right now, but just know their reasons. I think that's the important thing I'm trying to get across is their reasons for those. Okay, accent and stress hints. We don't have practice, we don't have time to actually practice listening for the stress in words, but these are some, and they aren't rules. They're not rules. I didn't even want to go so far as to say they're conventions, but they're hints. So when you have a word with two syllables, it's much more likely that the stress will be on the first syllable. But if you only have two syllables, you don't have as much that you have to work with. So yes, that's true. But if you've got a base element, then provide, that's a two syllable word, the stress is not on the first syllable, it's on the base. Then you have words like record, record, convict, and convict. And then depending upon the part of speech, the stress is going to shift. But the really useful ones, if you have a three syllable word or a four syllable word, very often, I would venture to say, but I can't give you a, a citation, that it's about 75% of the time, the stress will be on the third from the end. Now, if it's a three syllable word, you could say it's on the first syllable, but then it doesn't work for a four syllable word. So third from the end. So let's try it. Say cucumber. Is the stress on the third syllable from the end? Yes. Government, repeat it. Reference. Ridiculous. Provisional. Reciprocal. If you have, oops, this is not an SH. This is assuming, this could be any number of syllables. It doesn't mean three, it means any number of syllables. It could be fewer than three or more than three. But if the last syllable is one of those final stable syllables, shul, shus, shunt, shun, you've got that sh phoneme, and then you have the suffix. The stress is always on the syllable before, the, before that final stable syllable. So in this case, the final stable syllable is shun. Shun is not a suffix. The T is part of that a-T-E suffix. Delicious, shus, 
septify is a final stable syllable, but L-I-C-E is the base. And then shunt, F-I-C-E. What is important here is that before that final stable syllable will be the stress, and that's going to help you know what the vowel sound is in that syllable for sure. The stress is always before I-T-Y. The stress in a word, no matter how many syllables, will be for the ick, if that ick is a, the final syllable. Same thing for I-A-L. And these are ones that have connectives. Some of them do. Okay, this is the same thing, but without the examples. And this shows when there's a connective. There is some, the word is still out. There's a lot of discussion going on about whether T-Y is the suffix and I is a connective. But regardless of which way it turns out, the stress still comes before the ITY. And I just wanted, for those of you who are teaching students who learn English in a place other than the United States, pronunciation, there are pronunciation variations. So for example, British English speakers don't say controversy, they pronounce that word as controversy or contribute is pronounced as contribute. So don't assume if a student says a word in a different way than we speak it here in um, the United States, that they're mispronouncing it. They may be pronouncing it the way they were taught to pronounce it in a different English than American English. Oops, that was not what I intended to do. Okay, so words derived from Latin roots or base elements are most common in content area textbooks which means that one ki once kids get to the point of, read of getting their reading or their content from textbooks, then they need to be able to figure out what those words are. Analysis of the number of distinct English words printed in textbooks showed that students encountered over 88,000 distinct words through ninth grade. About half of those words, about half of those 88,000 words occurred once in a billion words of text or less. That's hard to believe, but inflate, extinguish, and nettle were three of the words given as examples. Now, if you're reading about firemen or community helpers, then extinguish is likely to occur more than once in a billion words. But because we're talking about content area text, depends upon the subject. There, if, if you're if your word that um, is on a topic that isn't discussed very often or isn't discussed in a certain grade level curriculum, then it might not occur except once in every billion words. So for every word a student learns, there are usually several related words and there are degrees of semantic transparency. So if you have red and redness, clearly red is the base word and N-E-S-S -S is the suffix. There's no question or there would, I can't imagine that there would be a question that red and redness are related. Apply and appliance are a little less obvious because the Y changes to an I when you add the suffix. And therefore the stu a student may or may not recognize it unless it's brought to their attention. But very, um, the least obvious would be a word like science. In science, you can hear the SCI, which is the base, which means to know, K-N-O-W. In conscience, it practically disappears, not, in, not visibly, but in the pronunciation. Same thing for conscious, conscientious, omniscient. So that would be one that students would have to have been specifically taught. They're not gonna pick it out from the pronunciation. In refer, we pretty much lose the vowel sound in conference, we don't, we don't speak it. And then this is the really important piece here. Why does it matter, you might say? Well, because the less morphological awareness a student has, the greater the number of separate individual distinct words he'll need to learn. The student with the least morphological awareness is least equipped to learn more words, but he has to because he doesn't make associations between the words that are related because of their, of their morphology. And he has to learn all those words separately and unfortunately often is trying to memorize them. 
So to emphasize that point, the less morphological awareness a student has, the more words he has to learn. But on the other side of that, the more morphological awareness he has, the fewer separate words he has to learn. So maybe I need to restate that in a positive form. Okay, set for variability. I'm gonna zip through this. I was gonna leave it out altogether. I might be sorry I didn't, but I'm gonna try to squeeze it in here. It's important because it means that at the same time that we're teaching kids to read using those foundational skills, we have to give them access to the vocabulary and the content knowledge that their peers, their grade level peers or their intellectual peers are familiar with because they have to have those words in their listening vocabulary in order to know if they're even pronouncing them correctly. So, Vineski, the ability to determine the correct pronunciation from available approximations to spoken English words. And that approximations means it's based on, on informed and systematic application of the knowledge of grapheme phoneme associations and syllable conventions, dividing words into syllables, and knowledge of vocabulary. It's using all of those. Remember right at the beginning when we talked about orthographic mapping? It's the sound, it's the, it's the speech sounds, it's the graphemes, it's the meanings. It's not random guessing. It's determining the correct pronunciation given the knowledge you have of orthography, morphology, phonology. Spelling conventions were invented to help readers decide how to pronounce a word. What is the role of vocabulary knowledge in the development of identification and accurate pronunciation of unfamiliar words? Is it possible that set for variability mediates the influence of vocabulary on development of word identification skills? That's the food for thought. You can certainly look up the um, information in the Vineski book, which is in the references and read more about it. But that's all we have time to talk about today. So successful problem solvers. We really are teaching our kids to be language scientists and they are learning to solve language problems. And the more confident they are in their ability to do it, then the more likely they are to try it on a regular basis and then they just become better and better at it. Students who are successful problem solvers develop confidence in their competence. This confidence motivates them to tackle the challenge of solving problems of all kinds with and without our assistance and that's the goal. If our students are only using what we teach them when we're there standing there giving them hints or just standing there then we haven't done our jobs. The student, these are the students who choose to use strategies independently and functionally in and out of school. People with fixed mindsets will only tackle tasks they already know how to do. Our kids are gonna try to tackle those that they're not sure of because they know that they know how to do the work. People with growth mindsets will tackle challenging tasks and they'll solve language problems because they know how the words work. Now, this is a lesson of a high school student. You see here, we're doing some letter, practice with letter connections, and I've dictated some final stable syllables, some phonemes, which would be the phoneme graphing part. Then I've uh, dictated some prefixes, but in most cases, I haven't dictated the pronunciation, I might say the Greek, oh, okay, write the, the Latin prefix that means with or together. Now these are assimilated forms, all four of these, or these three are assimilated forms of C-O-N. They haven't learned, there are others, but they had only learned these. Then write the Greek prefix that means with or together. They'd only learned this one, they hadn't learned S-Y-N yet. Write the twin bases that mean to step. So I'm giving them the meanings of these prefixes because the pronunciation of prefixes and suffixes and many base elements will change depending upon where they occur in the word. Um, so then I'm giving them, so if they've got, they have this base element that means to step and then I would give them the definition of these words, then change this word into an adjective and give them the definition, change it into a verb, graduate, change the verb, graduate into 
a noun that names the idea of graduating, graduation. So you see how that goes, but it's based upon, it's based upon all that they learned in the phonological aspects at the beginning, but it's being integrated now with the morphology. And they had a phrase here, digression from a concise discussion. And you see that they've used some decoding to try to proofread the spelling of what they've written. And this is just showing you that in this case, all of these things are combined, are integrating together into dictation. So I'm giving them, I gave them some practice with letter connections that they were gonna need. I gave them practice with some um, phoneme graphing practice. I also gave them practice in that section where I dictated the meanings of some of the morphemes. Then they uh, had some individual words or bases, and then they were adding suffixes to the words, and then a phrase was dictated. And I have the, what you saw there was an auditory lesson, but I highlighted this on the visual side because this work that they do when they're reading is reinforcing what that they're doing with spelling. They're not separate entities. They reinforce and work together. As Beth Slingerlin said, we can never teach them all they need to know, but we can teach them to think. And if we teach them to think and to solve problems, the sky's the limit. This is a student that I did not have in a class. This is a student that I taught um, individually. And you see that he, this was practiced with handwriting. Then we had practice with phoneme graphing. And then he wrote the word, I dictated program, he encoded it. And then after that, I asked him to change the word into a word that tells what's happening when he programs and he uh, added the suffix ing, new to double, make it into a word that names the person who programs, the programmer, make it into an adjective, programmable, go back to the word program or the STEM program and make it mean that you have to do it uh, again. Um, the best program of all, super program, the person who created the super program, super programmer, he made a mistake, that's what his brackets say. He has to, you have to take the program apart, deprogram. Then we did a similar thing with compute, past tense, happening now, adjective, um, and then put that one into a sentence. Math computation may be difficult to comprehend. And there was also a sentence with program, but it was on the back of the paper. Now, this is that student. I worked with him for two years, two times a week. He was going into middle school. He didn't need me anymore. He wasn't sure, he made me promise I'd save a spot for him just in case, which I did, but I knew he wasn't gonna need it. And when it came to our last session, he told me that he wanted to be the teacher. Um, and, I, and I said, well, no one's ever asked me that before, but um, I suppose you could be the teacher on, for the last session, but you would have to write a lesson plan. He said, of course. So he arrived, I sat in his place, he sat in my place, he asked me to write my uh, five minute journal, which we always did. And then I started, he gave me these letter connections to practice. He said, Jean, Shun, Asian, J, so this was the phoneme graphing, S, all the ways I knew to spell er. And then he gave me the word, I thought he gave me the word popper. And he, um, I, dutifully encoded pop, told him why I needed to double the P and I wrote it. He said, that was a good try, Nancy, but the word is pauper, someone without much money, a poor person. I said, okay. So then I decoded or encoded, excuse me, pauper. He gave me the word wealthy. He did want me to practice the Y rule. So I had to change wealthy to the word that means most wealthy and the one that means more wealthy. He dictated depression and then he came to the word midst. And when we first started working together, he would be annoyed sometimes and say, why can't English just be spelled the way it sounds? And I'd give him my spiel about the beauty and history of the language. So when we got to this word, he said, there are some people who would just prefer that English be spelled the way it sounds. However, and he gave me a much better spiel than I ever gave him about the history and beauty of the language. He said, Nancy, what does the word midst mean to you? I said, Middle. He said, very good. What do you hear in the middle of middle? And I said, duh. He said, remember that when you spell midst, which I did. He dictated the phrase. 
in the midst of the depression, and then a sentence which completely integrates every single part of the lesson, the wealthiest man on the block turned into a pauper overnight in the midst of the depression. That is a beautifully integrated lesson plan. Now, obviously, as you can see from the date, he's now an adult. He's had many jobs. Uh, he graduated from law school and he was a lawyer for a while. He's been a diplomat. And uh, currently he's back in the United States and he's a new father. He's a very proud new father. And he's so happy and I'm so happy for him. And he says that he can, and he, and he spells well, just so you know. So this, these were the last words of Marquis de Favres after reading his death sentence before being hanged. I see that you have made three spelling mistakes. Spelling counts. So big ideas. Words with spelling connections also have meaning connections. We don't know the pronunciation of a base until it surfaces in a word. The meanings of specific words need to be taught in ways that support students in understanding how words are connected semantically and morphologically, not just every word is a separate entity. This is a high school student on the first day of a 20 day summer school. He doesn't look much like a high school student's writing, does it? This was 19 days later. Now he still has a little confusion between the base element SCI and uh, C-I-S-E, but he's come a long way. This was, I'm gonna have to go a little faster, I just realized, but this is another lesson plan where you see, again, started with the letter connections, and in this case, morphemes, syllables, words, and then he was responsible for confidential information of grave import was the sentence dictation. And again, that's all the pieces that were involved in that lesson plan. And uh, Sue Heglin has a wonderful website. It's not in your references because I didn't actually know the website, uh, the link until uh, after I sent it, but it's here so you can get to it. But she says, when we ignore morphology and etymology in our instruction, the clues to comprehension that are embedded in the writing system are hidden from view. That's a very succinct way of what I just spent about eight slides trying to say. Thank you, Sue. So text organization, semantics and syntax, individual words, morphology, syntax, teaching students to read with prosody, relationships of words to words, words to phrases, phrases to clauses, and clauses to sentences. All of these are parts of, and the lesson plan in that C, preparation for reading, and sentences to paragraphs. So conventions um, of text organization, word order within phrases and sentences, parts of speech, both the form and the function. What is the part of speech? What does it do? And what word is it affecting? Words. If you know the parts of speech for words and what other kinds of words they modify or affect, the same is true for phrases. They act as the same parts of speech with the same functions and for clauses. And if you can do it for simple words, it's not such a stretch to do it for phrases and clauses. Grammar, word usage, types of sentences, all of that. And this is an example. And I, if you go back to uh, the lesson plan and you see, remember, see preparation for reading. These would be phrases that, I, that we would have taken out of a passage that we practice reading and there are four steps which i can't go through but there are four steps and ultimately you're teaching them phrase concept that phrases answer questions and phrases answer the same questions throughout whatever we're reading whether it's a narrative or expository text and then one of the steps is at, is giving them clues find the phrase that means how long or a period of time they obviously the clues wouldn't be up there I just put the clues here for you to see, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going fast. Okay, so syntax, the parts of speech, the word order, the sentence structure, the mechanics of language. It's critical for learning to read with prosody because reading with prosody means that whoever's reading is chunking words into meaningful phrases to support reading comprehension critical for construction of sentences in written expression. 
If you know what questions phrases answer, then you know how to put those phrases together and clauses together. This is the passage that those phrases came from. And I would, I would show you how the structured reading works, but I don't have time, sorry. Chunking text into meaningful phrases, recognizing meaningful chunks of text helps to develop fluency and comprehension. So practicing those phrases, what some people call front loading the information before they're actually reading the text. Though most readers chunk automatically, chunking strategies must be taught to struggling readers. Practice with reading phrases and other longer meaningful chunks of text helps to develop fluency and comprehension. Fluency, as you see, is much more than just how many words per minute. Phrase reading practice increases syntactic awareness. The function of phrases, the question answered by a phrase, relationship between words and phrases within sentences. This is an easier passage, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and I've shown you within the text, the phrases that might be taken out and practiced before we read the passage. Here are those phrases where we would practice the phrases and one of the steps has to do with meaning and clues. And this would be an example of clues that might be used for those particular phrases within that passage. Content knowledge and many types of language competencies are tapped for reading comprehension. But if a reader cannot parse the types of complex sentences that they're gonna come across in academic text, no amount of strategy comprehend, or, uh, comprehension strategy instruction will help. They still have to, be, to take apart the sentences into meaningful phrases. We want them to recognize sentence complexity when they see it in a particular domain. They need to deconstruct that complexity so that they can comprehend the sentence and be more fluent with it when they talk or write about the same content. Notice it's talk or write, so they have to comprehend what they read. They also have to understand how it's written and why it's written that way well enough to be able to use that when they're writing. I'm gonna let you read this for yourself. It's more about the, the uh, fact that guessing from context is not very useful. Speed is not the road to success. Careful practice is the road to speed. Prosody is reading smoothly with appropriate phrasing and expression, but most importantly, it's parsing of text into appropriate meaning-based segments. A computer can, take text and put it into words, into units of three or four words. But if those words that they put together don't answer questions, they're not phrases. For prosody to support comprehension, students must chunk words into meaningful phrases. Uh, Hune, Schwann, and Flugel, and Meisinger have been the uh, pro pushers for some really excellent research on fluency. And they propose the following definition. Fluency combines accuracy automaticity and oral reading prosody taken together all help the construction of meaning. Fluency is demonstrated during oral reading through ease of word recognition, appropriate pacing, phrasing and intonation. And fluency is a factor in both oral and silent reading that can limit or support comprehension. So within a daily lesson, as you saw in the Slurlin lesson, we have graphing phoneme practice, which at the single graphing level, which facilitates the decoding or uh, identification of words at the single word level, then preparation for reading, syntax and grammar at the phrase level, and then structured reading of syntax and grammar at the connected text level. All of it's included there in that. So how do we develop language comprehension? That's a beginning. So the principles of instruction that you're going to hear about in part three, direct explicit, structured systematic, cumulative sequential, multi-sensory, multimodal, diagnostic, evidence-based instructional principles guide the teaching of the structured literacy content, which is what we've been talking about today. So again, keeping in mind that whatever the approach is that's being used, that it's being used or implemented with fidelity by a teacher trained sufficiently to use it with fidelity. Intensity, which could mean the size of a group. It could be the number of sessions per week. 
the number of um, minutes per session, the number of days per week, duration over time, and of course, all together, it creates that efficacy. And I'm still looking for a good E, e word to replace efficacy. So know your stuff, know whom you're stuffing, stuff every minute of every lesson. Remember the canary and then the knowledge and practice standards. And I'm gonna read you very well, as quickly as I can. This is from, a, um, was written by a high school senior as he applied to college. It was his UC Berkeley uh, or his UC applicate was a common application for all the UCs. Um, and he started off by, he was a gifted athlete and he was, he played all the sports. He would come to his tutoring session at 7.30 after he'd been at school all day in whatever sport it was the season for, always with a great positive attitude. And never ever did I, was I aware that he was making any connection between his gift as an athlete and his uh, struggles or his challenges uh, in reading and writing. And so he came, he, um, the, the very beginning of the, of the essay started out, it was a championship game, he was the pitcher. It's a championship game and the next pitch was gonna win it or lose it. And he went on and explained, and I'm thinking, wow, this is really well-written, it's succinct, it's, it's great, he's come such a long way, I'm so proud of him. And the next sentence said, I knew I would pitch that ball exactly where it needed to go because I break down my pitches the way I learned to decode words. And I thought I must have misread it or was hallucinating or something. So I sat down and read it again. And that's exactly what it said. And what I'm going to read to you isn't the whole thing, but he was talking about when he first found out that he had dyslexia. He says, we began to talk and she explained I had dyslexia, a learning disorder. I didn't understand what she was telling me because a part of me didn't want to believe her. I didn't want to be different from my peers. She told me was affecting my English skills. My thoughts were clear, but when I tried to put them on paper, I often misspelled words or left words out of sentences. I had difficulty, difficulty applying rules because of a memory problem, making foreign language very challenging. We walked into the room and began the first of many sessions where I started the long process of learning the basics of the English language. For four years, I worked every week refining my English skills and finding new ways to comprehend material to fit my learning. Whenever I step onto a baseball mound, I try to emulate the skills to beat my opponent that I learned in that room. Just as I broke down words into parts to read them, I break down my motion to get the maximum power behind every pitch. I survey the field before every throw to make sure my team is ready. As I raise my leg, break my hands, I drive off the mound to deliver the pitch. When I write an essay, I follow the same process. I gather my information, break it into paragraphs, each paragraph essential to the meaning of the paper. I try to make every word count just as I try to pitch without any wasted motion. The foundation of my paper, the grammar and structure have to be strong, just as my fundamental baseball skills have to be strong. The skills that I've used throughout my life have taught me that if I patiently put forth my best effort, I will be rewarded by the quality of my work and the feeling of achievement. Okay, so here are the references and there's one or two added that weren't there when I sent it to you, but most everything is here. I added the Sue Heglin learning about spelling and thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we have a couple of questions and I'm going to unmute uh, to let you ask Mrs. Brooks. Do you wanna go ahead? Okay. Go ahead with your question. I can't hear. 